Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Compliance Online Live webinar. Today's topic is technical writing for pharmaceutical, medical device, and biotech industries. Thank you. And thank you for attending our training today on technical writing for the pharmaceutical, medical device, and biotech industries. We'll begin today by, ask, by talking about, or asking the question rather, what is technical writing? We see technical writing in every type of writing that we come in contact with in our everyday lives. It surrounds us uh, basically from the time that we wake up until the time that we go to bed at night. Um, if we have toothpaste tubes and we see writing on that, directions on toothpaste tubes, uh, directions on or benefits, nutritional information on cereal boxes or any type of food that we eat. Uh, we have technical writing that we look at in our business as far as business letters, catalogs, or um, anything that we receive in the mail, uh, written instructions for assembling products. If we have tax receipts and notices, these are types of technical writing. Um, product safety information. So we find that technical writing is all around us every day, and we are um, coming in contact with it every single day, and we're reading this information. Whether we realize it or not, we are in contact with technical writing and some form of technical writing every single day. So there's five competencies that we want to understand that are needed in the workplace for writing technical documents. So we need to be able to communicate essential information. And when we are writing a technical document, this not only is an SOP or a protocol or a business letter or um, a final report, it can be an email. Sometimes we write, um, we, we have to write down and we have to email our business documents, and we use emails to document meetings, to document conversations that have taken place, um, to document activities. So we have to be able to communicate information in our emails effectively and professionally as well. We want to be able to write proposals. Sometimes we have to do that so that we can obtain new business, and we have to be able to write and communicate the information that's necessary to win that business from our client. We have to be able to communicate key instructions to colleagues or, or convey policies to customers. And we do all of this by email, and it has to be um, this information when we're doing this and we're writing these emails, even though we don't think of email as being a very technical document, but we have to get the, point, the points across and get the information in such a way that the reader understands it, is not left with questions, and, there is, it, and we can't be very long and drawn out with presenting this information. So even using email, we have to be, um, have to know how to structure that information in a concise, clear, accurate way. When we're writing SOPs, be sure that we're very clear about things. And this is not only with SOPs, but this is in every type of technical writing. We have to be concise. We have to be clear. We have to state in our SOPs what the objective or the purpose of the SOP is. What is the applicability and the use of this SOP for our scope? Who is performing these tasks in the responsibility section? Who is going to ensure the implementation in the accountability section? And then this is where your step-by-step -step instructions come into play in your actual procedure. We do want to keep in mind, though, and we have to keep this in mind, not only for SOP writing, but for other documents. And we're going to discuss those other documents as well for protocols or for uh, final reports. We must understand and keep in mind how much the person that we're writing to or the reader knows about the entire process 
or how the job affects the way or he sh- or what she knows about the job, the knowledge that they know about the job, the previous knowledge will affect how they perform the job. So we have to keep in mind who we're writing to, how much knowledge they have, how much prior knowledge. We also have a conclusion, and again, as stated before, the conclusion is going to talk about the overall results of the validation. It's going to indicate if the validation was a success and indicate if the validation passed or failed. So we're just giving the overall results, uh, restating the main points of the validation and indicating if the validation passed or failed. It's not a long, drawn-out paragraph, no more than, say, five to six sentences. Um, in a typical conclusion. We want to add more information in the final report about the validation and discussing the acceptance criteria.